Hey, what's going on, guys? It's Brian Jack with Superman's Comics, and we are back again talking about those trends in the comic book community. That's right. This is that three up, three down. We're giving you three up trends and three down trends, and we're going to start right now with those up trends before we get into it. Jack, how's your week so far? Oh, so far, so good. Obviously, today uh, we're recording this on Tuesday, which is election day. So as the country participates in the democratic process and decides uh, where we're going to go with the next four years, uh, we are going to help you guys decide where you're going to go with your comic book collection by looking at what is moving up and what is moving down in the comic book community. Right, we're getting into it right now with those upward trends. The first one we want to talk about is Moon Knight. Moon Knight's picking up with comic book news, but it's also picking up with that multimedia news, right? Yeah, that's right. Big, big time movie news um, coming in from Moon Knight. Certainly one of the more anticipated MCU uh, properties. Now, we've talked on the channel for quite some time about the Moon Knight casting and all of the rumors uh, leading up until the kind of final uh, announcement. And we heard names like uh, Keanu Reeves and Shia LaBeouf. And we talked about things like Keanu Reeves being kind of tough because he's older. This is a character they want to go for some time. And really, Marvel and Disney didn't have to go too far to find their Moon Knight because they went with Oscar Isaac, who's kind of best known to people in uh, our kind of realm of nerd culture as Poe Dameron from Star Wars. And uh, this is seemingly a great casting. I think it's the right kind of actor for the role. Um, and it's an actor who can really kind of grow into this role. And we have seen almost immediate spikes in Moon Knight, which is tough because we've already seen that like in Moon Knight's first appearance is astronomical. Uh, you know, several other books, people really don't know where to go with their speculation because there's so, still so much unknown about this series. Who, who are going to be the villains? Um, most people honestly don't have a real working knowledge of even the character Moon Knight. So there's still so much up in the air about this, but that's kind of what's exciting is it feels like there's still a lot left to be found out and a lot of books to chase and a lot of money to be made with this character. But certainly the spikes are beginning already as people get excited with casting news. Yeah, there's a lot of comic book purists, I guess you could say, that have been waiting for this announcement, waiting for this casting announcement. Everyone kind of knew it was coming, but here we have it. So a lot of people, I'm sure, are happy out there right now. And it's, and it's great to see what's going to happen with these Moon Knight books. I mean, a lot of people look after those David Finch covers, but there's a lot of other great books out there as well. Next one we want to talk about on that three up. We've been talking about this series for quite a bit on this channel, but no doubt right now, a lot of other people are talking about it as well. We're talking about Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Yeah, Ninja Turtles is red hot right now. And you're right, we've been talking about this since you and I linked up and started doing this uh, a couple of years ago now. Um, <clears throat> we've largely believed that nostalgia drives people's buying decisions and the, the next generation uh, of a uh, collector uh, who, of adult who's really going to go out and buy their childhood is kind of going to tra transition from a lot of those popular properties of the 60s and 70s that seem to dominate the marketplace into these 80s and 90s uh, properties. And we're, and we're already seeing this happen. And what we've seen going on with Ninja Turtles right now is really everybody in comics is paying attention to Ninja Turtles because they got a hot storyline on top of which you've got the last Ronin, which is, take away Ninja Turtles. It's just probably the hottest comic book of 2020. Uh, one of the more anticipated books of the last several years. And that is amazing. That's always going to draw attention to the universe, but it would really be kind of nothing if it wasn't for what was going on in Sophie Campbell's ongoing series. The new characters introduced this kind of uh, seemingly fluid way she's able to introduce these characters and then bring them into the story and immediately make them important uh we've already seen lita for one having a paramount importance and what's really brought the, that ongoing series into the publishing light and there's an article about this uh we talk about a major team and t bolo on simplemanscomics.com is the upcoming solicit for tmnt number 113 you get kind of a uh, almost uh X-Men looking cover where you're peering into the future and you see the Splinter Clan uh, in the future. You're seeing Adult Lita. Um, you're seeing uh, the Weasels, Zink, Zana, and uh, Mushroom all grown up. Uh, you know, you're seeing the Turtles older. Um, and it, this has brought up so much speculation just about 
this issue because while people are excited for this issue and you're certainly going to see like one in 10 incentives for that issue, I'm sure go crazy, even though this will be a, a kind of a high ordered issue. What the real keys are is the fact that like that adult issue, uh, adult lead of first appearance in issue number 105. Issue number 105 is, is underrated where it's sitting right now. And issue number 101, when you see the popularity of Lita in general on her first appearance in issue 101, that book is underrated. So I expect those two books to be absolutely nuclear as we go in the next three months and get towards that issue 113, which is going to start a brand new arc in the ongoing. So that, uh, on top of um, what's going on with The Last Ronin, on top of the fact that there is a Seth Rogen animated movie coming that people have kind of slept on, um, all of that is reasons to be excited for the TFMNT universe. Yeah, we talk about it on this channel a lot. A lot of those 80s franchises are catching heat again. Mass of the Universe is, is hot. Those books are going up in value as well. One that I don't see a lot of people talking about is one that I've been buying books up for, and that is that great 80s animated series when I'm talking about Thunder, Thunder, Thundercats. I've been picking those books up because I see that trend going. I think Thundercats might catch on as well, especially if these 80s franchises pick up and you start seeing more of these reboots. Either way, the last one we're going to talk about on that three up portion right now is we were fortunate enough to have some exclusive covers by her on our exclusive variants. And we are talking about Megan Hutchinson pretty soon. That one guy is just going to be referred to as Megan's husband. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. So this is uh, a entry on the list that I feel like we had to acknowledge, but also comes with kind of a sense of personal pride for us because this was something that we saw as a possibility months and months and months ago. We, we really, when we started working on our variant program, when we sat down, if you go back to the very first time that we started putting together an Asana, uh, working with the 616 uh, comics folks, if you're not familiar, Asana is kind of like a workflow program that a lot of businesses are using. And one of the first things that kind of like in the top end goals, we kind of had these like detailed goals and then kind of like some big top end goals. And one of the top end goals was we want to work with Megan Hutchinson. And we have a belief that Megan Hutchinson is a star and that people haven't yet fully realize this. And so we started working with Megan, but I can't take credit, regardless of it being my idea. Um, no, no, none of us involved from us, 616, who has done a great job curating and continuing to work with her and put out great books. Um, it, none of us can take credit. The credit goes to Megan because the reality is Megan is an extremely versatile artist uh, who can do, you know, horror and goth to the to the max but at the same point come with a, a superhero cover that is big to esque um i think that she has unlimited potential but where she really has the secret sauce is something that you and i have talked about is when you're in this space where you're either an artist especially like freelance uh you're doing cover art or if you're a creator own comic you know producer creator really how you sell yourself on social media becomes paramount and, you know, you brought it up, you know, just a reality, which is that she, I call her the dark queen of comics because she is, uh, you know, the king. Donnie Kate is right hand, his wife. Um, but, yeah, it's not like people are talking about these great covers and saying, oh, yeah, that's Donnie Kate's wife. I mean, they're talking about the work that she is doing, but her presence on social media, the way she is liked, which is half of this comics business is just being liked the way she is liked by people uh, makes a big difference. So when you look at the, the very first book we, we were able to sell out was department of truth. Um, she did an amazing cover for that. She's got an ice cream man, 21 variant right now. That's making a lot of noise in the market. People really love that. Uh, that's great starting from concept to seeing where people really kind of love that whole uh, cover. Uh, you know, amazing job on crossover, uh, obviously Donnie Cates' book. So, and, and some more fun stuff coming. So Megan Hutchinson is really, I think we're going to see that name get bigger and bigger and bigger. And it's one of those things that's kind of awesome as Donnie's star rises. Uh, you know, I think we're going to also see Megan's as well. So there's the upward trends we have for you this week. Now we're going to migrate over to the downward trends. And the first one we're talking about, this one got, got a lot of craze. And if you've ever been to a convention where these people are, they're definitely great at selling their books. But they had some news not too long ago that they got picked up by option by HBO. But we see it down right now when we are talking about Stranger Comics. 
Yeah, so this has kind of always been a difficult topic, a controversial topic in our circles. Uh, we came from uh, writing for a speculation website uh, that was one of the first to break news about Stranger Comics, but also had people involved all in with stranger comics who formerly worked at the website so there was all kinds of uh questions and there was infighting and debate about whether or not this was really gonna be a thing and uh i remember when we got the word and there was a, a graphic of them going to hbo we posted that on instagram um, but we were immediately reached out to to take it down so this was always kind of something that was shrouded in a bit of doubt and mystery. And I never had a, a dog in the fight. Um, full disclosure, I never, I kind of came in late from the whole like Stranger Comics game. So I didn't, um, I didn't load up on Niobe and all of those books that I think a lot of people really struck um, and hit home runs with. I, I didn't, so I really didn't, I, I've never really had a dog in this fight. I've always hoped that this was going to be something that was going to come to fruition, but I've always been kind of leery of what you mentioned. Um, and I, I, you said it kind of in jest and maybe polite, but um, the stranger comics folks are aggressive. So when you're at a convention, uh, I directly was just standing by their booth uh, waiting for you. As a matter of fact, you were, you were coming from another publisher booth in Baltimore comic con. And um, I remember as soon as you walked up, I told you what I had just heard. I heard, a, I heard an employee, I, I don't know, it could be, you know, a big wig. I don't know who it was, uh, but it could be just an employee pitching a customer at the booth saying that they should spend, you know, like it was like $200 for a variant because, you know, as soon as that, that, that property hits HBO, it's going to be the next Walking Dead. <clears throat> and that is certainly a dangerous assertion to tell uh, a comic book buyer. Certainly, if I said anything um, was the next Walking Dead, I expect to get, um, you know, held accountable by the community. And the one property that I've gone out on a limb and said, I think that we may be heading in that direction. And here's the empirical evidence why something's killing the children. Um, so I root for the Stranger Comics folks. I hope that everything turns out and comes out. But the problem is we have never gotten an, an official announcement from HBO. Um, we have heard no movement on the show. Um, we have heard very little to anything from publishing from Stranger Comics. And uh, the whole thing kind of starts to feel murky. And it starts to feel like some of those people who were very negative, uh, uh, who came off maybe as just being negative about the situation, may have been on to something. Um, so it, it's one of those things we've been talking about for the last couple of weeks is their kind of almost disappearance from the comic market. So they're definitely a downward trend right now. Could be buying opportunity, but um, you know, could be dead on arrival. Yeah, I will say I've noticed their distribution has grown wider. I started seeing more and more copies within my local comic shop that used to didn't carry it. And who knows, maybe it's just a low in the announcement and the low in the development. But as of right now, this this time period, it's definitely down. Along with the next one, here's something that when the option news came out, this was a lot of books that people were buying up. I remember seeing cover A going up to like 30 bucks at one point, but now the movie has released within the past couple weeks. And I'm not hearing much news about this book. And we are talking about boom studios, empty man. Yeah. And a lot of people know that, you know, we have some good contacts in at boom studios, but this isn't a situation where we are in the know. So I don't know if this is the type of thing where, um, you know, this was, something that was so in the works pre-COVID. Um, I don't know how the contract stuff worked. I know they now are first look with Netflix. I think this was before that. Um, yeah, this so I don't was think a couple this... years ago, I believe. When this yeah, was so, this, 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 so this wasn't a property that was like rejected by Netflix, but releasing a theatrical release in the middle of a, a pandemic, as right now we've seen, is, is just difficult. So Empty Man is getting zero, zero traction in, in the market as a film, but on top of it, as a comic property, I think the average um, comic consumer is unaware of the fact that this is now not just a property that has been optioned or has been cast or has a showrunner. You know, this is here. And um, this should be the time where people are kind of cashing out. Uh, I did a like a, a cursory eBay search just a, literally a few minutes ago. Um, and found like uh, issue number one, Joel Jones variant uh, with like minutes left with a 99 cent bid, no bids, 450 shipping. So 
um, there's there's just not the demand there um, that you would typically see. Now, we've talked about things having a life after their initial release on streaming. Streaming is going to change the game in that regard. We've talked about that as it could impact The Walking Dead. And I certainly think there's going to be movies, and this could be one of them, that are maybe going to miss the mark on initial release. They'll, they'll land on Amazon. They'll land on um, Hulu. They'll land on Netflix. And then they will find an audience, and that may impact the comic market in ways we have not typically seen within the usual spec cycle. But having said that, um, that's a very optimistic approach on this problem property because we're as it stands right now it seems like this is a swing and miss and i gotta say Brian, at this point um in my speculative uh kind of like current you know testing of the climate i think that holding on to independent properties until the moment that like the the actual property come out comes out is like is really difficult i think old guard is the only (laughs) yeah i and i think old guard's the only time where you know maybe that paid off in the last several, several that, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's gotta be though, kind of like a sleeper, like Umbrella Academy and the boys kind of came out of like, people didn't expect the level of success that they gained versus like, if you were sitting there with V Wars or uh, October Faction, or um, think if you're thinking movies, um, The Kitchen from Vertigo was a, was a big flop. Um, and these were books that all these books you could have made profit on if you flipped them at announcement time, but if you held them till release, uh, you were now holding books of unsuccessful movies and unsuccessful TV shows. Yeah. And the, I mean, like you mentioned, the, it's hard with the theatrical release during COVID right now. I mean, theaters are running out entire theaters. AMC can yeah. run an entire theater for, I think as low as 99 bucks right now. So, um, one thing I did like is, just like we mentioned with last week with Hellstrom, where the Hellstrom had like l- hardly any Marvel property branding on it. This one, that movie has that nice new boom. You know, it's a boom property. And I th- I hope it's just the first of many that come to those theatrical releases. Cause I think boom has some great, especially creator owned series there, but yeah. And this is Cullen Bunn. This is Cullen Bunn horror on, on the big screen. So we we know you guys out there in the comic community, love Cullen Bunn horror. We hear about that all the time. So this is one of those things where if you're looking for like a cool horror movie right now, this may be one to check out. But the last one of the three down this week, this isn't just down this week, but seems to be down a lot. We're talking about eBay fees. Yeah. So I have been having some discussions with resellers lately. Um, a lot of you know, may, some of you may not, I come from the reselling community outside of comic books prior to getting into comic books. Um, I have we got my start in sports cards, managed a sports card store, uh, managed a NASCAR merchandise and collectible store, as well as selling at NASCAR tracks. And, and in my professional career as an adult, I ended up getting into the sneaker industry um, and dealt with sneaker resellers and all of that. Um, so, in it, I've been involved with various different types of retailers uh, um, and resellers, as well as like clothing retailers and resellers, proxy of being in the um, in the sneaker business. And it, it's where I got like the Bolo moniker from. And they, it's one of those things where we sell comics, right? And we talk about things like eBay fees and the percentages and how that affects us and ROI. And it's a little different and from category. Sales tax that was added now. Right. And it's a little different from category to category. Every category kind of um, has its own challenges and its own uh, problems, but you can learn a lot from the things that are affecting other uh, categories. And something that I think is, is really worth noting is something that's happening in the sports card category right now. Um, And I think that sports cards are so related to comics the fact that this is happening in sports cards in they, they do probably a slightly higher volume on eBay than comics, I think is something that we have to pay attention to because it could end up in our market. So when we're talking eBay fees, we're all, we're uh, the kind of like rule of thumb, loose math is you're looking at about 13%. You're looking at about 10% for your eBay fee, uh, you know, your final listing fee. And then you're looking at about 3% for your processing, PayPal, all of that, whether whoever you're doing it, Google pay. Um, and that's, again, that's rough. That's not exact in, in you mentioned Brian's sales tax. That's so that 
started to factor in, into things. Um, and then, at, you know, let's be honest, eBay used to be a tax shelter for a lot of people. Yeah, when I say um, sales tax, I'm not saying that's it, part of it. Sales tax isn't a seller fee, but it goes into the buyer's mind when they're looking at it now and now right. they pay tax on top of it. Right. Um, and, and, at, and then as well as all of that, um, you've started to add promotional listings. And promotional listings are difficult because you can say, well, they're optional. Okay, but if you don't promote your listings and everyone else is promoting their listings, you are not going to get seen compared to everybody else, which is going to ultimately, as you said, affect your sales. So all of these things have happened that it, it have kind of creeped up. If I look at my like overall eBay sales, I'm not operating at 13% because you got to add in those promotional fees um, and you start to also look at like the increases that's going on with USPS and shipping and everything like that. And we've had to try to account for that. It's made free shipping difficult. You're paying your, you're also, you're paying final listing fees based on your shipping. If you're doing free shipping. So there's all of these expenses to account for. And I know that we got kind of long winded at for an intro to say, what is going on though in sports cards right now is returns are now affecting your overall final listing price. Uh, and what I mean by that is in sports cards, they are the, the hobby is, is so speculative. The market moves so fast. Uh, people in the sports card industry, new people coming in during this current boom in the sports card industry are abusing loopholes on eBay that have always existed, right? We've all been afraid of them, but people are starting to abuse them in mass levels in sports cards. So what are they doing? Well, uh, they're buying a sports card to speculate on. And when it goes down inside the window of return, they're just returning that card, no questions asked, to the seller. Uh, the seller now is get, happening to pay back that money, might be two, three weeks later, it, it, whether you have that money currently on hand or not, causing most dealers to really want to hold their money. Um, and then on top of that, uh, you know, you're, you're ended up being out like fees and expenses and things, but the worst part about that is most of these people that are doing returns because they don't really have to put some like answer of why they're doing it. Item not as described. They're just clicking right. Item not as described, which is the most common one because they think they're not going to get a question to it. Well, now in sports, arguing about the number, I've heard five in a month. I've heard five and a quarter. But if you get a certain number of those, you are getting an added 5% to your final listing fees until the eBay deems you now are listing your items more accurately, even though that has absolutely nothing. And a very, very big and prominent sports card dealer and breaker came out, certainly somebody who would not do anything like, a, you know, you know, b below board, they are, they're very prominent in the sports card industry. They can't, can't get away with dirty tactics. Um, just got hit with that added 5% because of this like mass return thing that's going on in the sports card market. I really hope that doesn't end up in the comics market. I really hope we don't have people buying variants on release day and then returning them four days later when they don't kind of go up the way they kind of hope. Um, I really hope that's, I know that that does go on in a small scale already, but I hope we don't see it in a mass scale because we have now seen the way eBay will respond to that. And I don't think there's a single dealer out there. And I know some dealers who do huge high volume on eBay. And I cannot imagine the frustration of those dealers. If they were to get an email tomorrow, Brian, that said, you have to pay 5% more from now on. 5% um, may sound like a small number, but that is a chunk of change when you're talking about some of the volume of some of the guys that we know. That's why I don't even like selling on eBay. That's why I don't like, I don't do much reselling in, in general just because of all the crap that goes with it. But yeah, yeah that's, and that's sort of my opinion is um, eBay is the greatest platform in the world because they have the largest audience, but you have no control. And anytime that you are selling on a platform where they can just send you an email and say, you will pay us 5% more now, um, you're, you're, you're in a, tough situation so to all you guys out there selling comics look into shopify look into selling on on instagram um you know look into facebook live sales look into youtube auction sales or Get creative. Macari, a lot of i don't know how macari right? works but yep macari absolutely absolutely yeah the, some of these smaller apps and platforms and then somebody out there who is a uh um you know a a one of these web developers needs to build in the sports card market. They have a platform called checkout my cards where you can actually send 
your card to them. They hold it uh, and manage all the sales. You don't have to ship. You don't have to do, you only ship one time. It's, it's a great thing that is added to that industry. We need that in the comics industry. So more innovation um, will allow us to be able to not be such a slave to the eBay platform that we all kind of currently, whether we like it or not, are. So there it is, guys. There's our three up, three down for this week. Let us know what you guys think's up. What do you guys think is down? What do you think about this list? Always love to hear the comments from you guys. Makes great. Simple Man's Comics community. You guys are always the best. With that being said, this is Brian Jack from Simple Man's Comics. We'll see you guys in the next video.